Mr. Chairman. So uh, I'm very, very happy to be here, and I must uh, start uh, by apologizing, apologize, uh, by, by saying apologize, uh, because first of all, I will not be able to stay up to the end of the meeting to leave this afternoon. Sorry for that. And the other thing is that I will probably be very, very long in my talk, so I, I, I'm sure that uh, Gilbert will cut me if I'm too long. Um, that's why I, I was pleased to be able maybe to try to, to, to gain some, there's a problem with the yeah. microphone, sorry. So if it's possible, I, I gain some minutes from uh, uh, Tony's uh, spare time. Um, okay, so I, I'm coming from Lyon. Uh, maybe you know Lyon because of this. Uh, I would have prefer uh, these days to say that we know Lyon also because of football, but I realized yesterday that Madrid did not uh, make it as well as Lyon, finally. So uh, this is a specialty in Lyon, but of course I will not talk about gastronomy, although talking about ceramics is uh, frequently a question of cooking. Um, I will talk about microscopy, and I must say that this exercise is a bit difficult uh, because it's, it's a very wide subject, and uh, we've, we've been seeing a lot of electron micrographs uh, these last days, and it, this helped, in fact, somehow, because what I would like to do is not really to show you nice examples or wonderful examples of what can be done with the, the, the latest techniques, but maybe to give you a, flav a flavor of what can be done, of course, but also how we can understand some tricks of the electron microscope images, and uh, for example, how does it work actually, what is the meaning, the physical meaning of this, this or this technique, uh, what, what do we see this kind of contrast and things like that. So I will do that with a lot of example on uh, ceramic material, material. And so actually when we want to characterize material and especially a ceramic material, we certainly have to, to go through the microstructure. Going through the microstructure means uh, going from the uh, general view and general um, um, uh, scale of the microstructure, that is optical microscopy, and then going further and further uh, with uh, scanning electron microscopy. And I will show you a lot of examples of rather recent application of scanning electron microscopy for the characterization of the microstructure of material, and especially ceramics. And so going deeper and deeper, we can, of course, approach the transmission electron microscopy in which we will be able to look at the microstructure in terms of grains, but also nearly at the end in terms of atomic uh, structure and atomic resolution. For example, we all know, and I will uh, come back on that because we heard already on, about that, that subject, that in ceramic material, there is an important issue about grain boundaries, structure, and so on. So uh, electron microscopy is obviously the best, I would say, kind of best uh, technique to do that. It's in fact the best technique to give a direct view of the structure. We heard also about techniques that gives you information about the structure, microstructure, but in, the, in an indirect uh, way that is uh, essentially in the Fourier space. But at, at one stage, you really need to see the, 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 the microstructure to know, well, this is this area that I want to Examine because this is this area that controls the microstructure of uh, material. So what I will uh, try to go into very rapidly, and uh, I say that uh, it's a huge domain, so I will be very fast, and I, I apologize for that, but so I will skip a lot of, probably a lot of uh, uh, transparencies, but uh, the objective is that I, you, you have those transparencies to say work a bit at home or at least going through the references that I put, having some uh, more precise ideas if you want to go into that. So I have three, I would say, topics. First, imaging techniques. Second, electron microscopy analysis technique. And maybe if I have time, some further illustration. So imaging technique, 
techniques. I have four techniques to go into. I will talk about SEM, FIB techniques, TEM, and an application of the TEM, the STEM, HADF imaging. So, uh, as I said, I will skip a lot of transparencies. This is a very general transparency and very basic one to tell you what is a, an electron uh, microscope working in the scanning mode, scanning electron microscope. What you know is that um, nowadays, uh, with a modern FEG machine, we, we can achieve nanometric, clearly nanometric resolution and even sub-nanometric resolution. But I will not go into more detail on that. The, the imaging mode you, you, you know very well uh, are basically the, the secondary electron imaging mode and the backscatter the electron uh, mode. And we, if we look to the repartition of the, those electrons with the energy, uh, since the secondary electrons have a very small energy, they have to come up from the very top surface, and that's usually the way we, we, we think in terms of resolution, that is the, this is the best way to get the better resolution in the, in the uh, scanning electron microscope. Now if we go to a backscatter electron, they will be sensitive to the Z of the material, that is, we, we have some kind of chemical contrast. And this is a, a very clear illustration of that uh, about composites with a light element that is the matrix of made of alumina with a zirconia and a yttrium oxide, which are obviously easier material than alumina. So what, what is probably not as well known is the STEM mode in the scanning electron microscope. That could be confusing because I will talk about STEM mode in the transmission electron microscope, but here we are in the transmission mode in a scanning electron microscope. Uh, the idea is that to, to, to use the beam and to collect electron that goes out uh, through the sample with a dedicated detector which is placed below the sample. Obviously for that, you need to have some kind of thin specimen. But what is really surprising when you talk about scanning electron microscope that is uh, uh, incident energy of about 30 or 30 kV, is that surprisingly you can, you can transmit a lot of electrons and a lot of information in rather thick material, even to uh, the one micron uh, thickness. So that, that is very interesting, and I, you, you will see a lot of, I, I will show a lot of application. And for example, the first application I show, it's uh, surprising to see that these two images are very, very, very similar. Uh, these are uh, metallic carbides, that is nanoparticles deposited on a carbon film. This is a, a TEM image. This is the, the same area, the scanning electron, uh, secondary electron image. Uh, obviously, the contrast is less than in the transmission electron microscope because of the, 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 the surface of the carbon film. This is what I, I, I will uh, detail later, the HADF mode in the TEM, and this is the equivalent in the SEM, th that is the STEM mode in the SEM. And you see that those two images are very, very similar. And we can achieve a very good resolution in that mode in the SEM, that is about two nanometer. That makes it a very interesting tool. And it's a very interesting tool uh, for, for different applications I will show in, 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 a, in a while. Uh, another recent trend in uh, scanning electron microscopy is the low voltage imaging. It's not really that recent, but uh, uh, recent developments uh, these last years make it uh, more and more applicable to uh, material science. The idea is that if you, if you, uh, if you have electron that goes uh, with a very low energy, they, they cannot uh, penetrate deep in the material compared to, uh, obviously, either uh, kinetic energy. So the lower penetration means a better sensitivity to the surface. And this is an example of some uh, clay material. When you see that if you go to very small uh, incident electron energy, you can uh, reveal a lot of details on the surface. And then you can uh, have a new view of uh, the uh, material um, in terms of uh, looking at the, at, at the surface, especially. Um, we may wonder how we can achieve to, to, to get so, so slow electrons in electron microscope. Essentially, all, all the constructors, manufacturers are in fact working with an electron beam which, which goes fast as usual with 30 kilovolt electrons. And it is just delayed before arriving at the sample uh, surface. And we can, uh, uh, we can uh, go even below 100 volt. So, Another very interesting and recent, rather recent trend is environmental electron microscopy, and uh, especially in the SEM. Uh, basically, we have to play with the pressure and temperature 
diagram of water. And obviously, you know uh, that if you uh, go on the vacuum uh, at, a no, um, at normal temperature, ambient temperature, you cannot, uh, you cannot keep water as a liquid. Uh, if you want to keep water as a liquid, you have uh, to uh, raise the pressure. So with a very uh, a drastic differential uh, pumping system in, in the transmission, in the scanning electron microscope, it's possible to have a control pressure and to, to keep hydrated samples in the scanning electron microscope. And that's, that's very interesting for a lot of applications. For, uh, first of all, certainly for organic materials, uh, but also for hydrated system, I will show some example. For non-conductive objects, because there is some kind of effect of charge compensating at the surface, which prevents you to uh, uh, put a metal layer on top of your uh, non-conducting materials. And also for in-situ temperature, since you are not anymore in vacuum, so uh, the temperature, equilibrium, and regime is it's much uh, easier to control. So uh, just to show you uh, uh, an in-situ experiment, uh, this is an oxidation of uh, uranium oxide, which uh, is uh, uh, believed, of course, to transform at high temperature, about 650 degrees, from UO2 to U3O8. And what we see here is a sequence of image that shows that the particle is just exploding because there is a, a volume ex expansion from the crystallography regarding this transformation. And of course, the, the material is just uh, exploding this way. So this, this can be easily done in a scanning electron microscope uh, in the environmental mode because, of course, you need oxygen source uh, to, to produce the oxidation. Um, another interesting application of uh, this environmental microscope is to mix both uh, approaches, that is the environmental mode and the scanning uh, transmission mode I, I talked about a few minutes ago and especially to, to look to, uh, into liquids. So the, the idea is that just to put, uh, you, you're working on solution, let's say colloidal solution, for example, of particles, and this is an example of uh, something like 20 nanometer gold nanoparticles which are looked down in water, in the stem, in this stem mode. You just put a drop of your uh, so solution on a typical uh, uh, oily carbon grid for TM, and you, you've got some drop, some menisc, menisc uh, in between the bars, and you can, you can, if the thickness is small enough, you can just go through uh, these uh, this, uh, places. Uh, this is an example which, uh, 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 an example of a work which was uh, performed by uh, Mirella, uh, who, is, who is here uh, in, uh, in the Matteis lab. Uh, these this are suspension of uh, transition aluminum nanopowders and uh, as we, we heard a lot these last days, uh, the problem is the agglomeration of the, uh, these na nanopoders. And we can, we can check uh, this, is, this is the basic uh, material without any milling. And this is in that also in, in water, not especially uh, really water, because we have a solution with a, uh, a certain pH to control the, the distribution of the particles. We can, we can check that after a, a concept, um, 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 a sufficient milling, we, we can separate those particles. And we see be below, of course, uh, this is the carbon, uh, all a carbon grid for the TM uh, um, um, specimen uh, grid. Another example, these are, this is a colloidal suspension of silica balls. That is what you use for final uh, metallographic polishing of materials. And again, uh, this, is, uh, this is looked down in water. And what we see here, if you think in terms of an equilibrium of, of the, the surface of the liquid, it, it will produce a menis that is in the center, the, the thickness is much more important than on, on the edge. And it's, it's what we, we see here. The intensity is very dark in the middle, that is the, the electrons cannot go through because the thickness is too high. But we look uh, on, the, on the edge of this droplet and we see those particles actually in water and under uh, these kind of conditions. Uh, I didn't mention the pressure. Uh, which is about the fi five tor in the five tor range. Uh, so since we, we we have the possibility to go to, to look through the material in the SEM, what what about trying to do uh, tomography? Tomography uh, is being doing in, uh, with with a lot of techniques, X-ray, SEM, TM, and we come back for for the TM application of that, and. It's, we are not really doing tomography. People say tomography, but it's not exactly tomography. 
we can call it tilting tomography. The principle wa was illustrated by this montage. You look to the sample in different direction and then with a, a dedicated algorithm of reconstruction, you can uh, restore the, the volume. So uh, it's very interesting to have the tomography in material science at different level. We can go from uh, the micrometer or slightly sub-micrometer resolution with the X-ray tomography, and uh, this, is a, this is a stand actually, we, we heard about stands uh, this morning, to the angstrom resolution with the atom probe tomography. I, I, I should not, I cannot speak about atom probe tomography because first I'm not specialist and secondly it's a, a bit too early to speak about this technique regarding ceramic material. What I mean by too early, atom probe tomography is probably a technique you, you don't know which is not very well spread out of the world but it's essentially uh, field uh, yarn microscopy. And for field yarn microscopy, you need to have a conducting material. And most ceramics are not conducting. So you cannot explore the microstructure at the atomic level with this atom probe tomography uh, for non conducting material. But this is actually not, this is what, this is the state of art today. But now people and manufacturers are building. Um, um, instrumentation with laser pulsed emission. And we are not on the point to look at non-conductive material, but we are on the point to look at semiconductor materials, semiconducting materials. And that means that within a few years, we certainly be able to, to look at uh, non-conductive ceramic material with this technique. And when it, when it works nicely, you, you have the atomic resolution in 3D. And this is an example of a grain boundary in a metallic alloy. And you see it's slightly turning. And when we, we, we go in a good direction, you see alignments of at green atoms, which are actually aluminum atoms in, in, a, in an aluminum alloy in this case. So we want, we, we want to go from the micron resolution to the nanometer resolution with the TEM and also with the SEM. So to do that, uh, we just build up in, in our lab, uh, a, a dedicated specimen holder in order to be able to till the specimen. And then we just uh, produce the tilting experiment. Maybe I can go, oops. OK, let's do it again. This is the tilting experiment. This is not a real uh, ceramic nanocomposite, but it's, a, uh, let's say, oxide particles in a polymer uh, for reinforcement uh, purposes. And you see the tilting. Uh, sequence, and we clearly see already we have a feeling of the of the 3D microstructure. And once once you've done that, we, you you can of course do the reconstruction with the, this software. And after that, of course, we can reproject the the, the reconstructed volume. You can uh, identify any particles. We can do any kind of statistics in 3D. Uh, we may wonder, well, is there a real interest of doing tomography for nanocomposites or for, for material, but especially for nanocomposite? Nanocomposite, we can think uh, in terms of a dispersion of particles in a matrix. So um, I would just use another example, uh, which is a, a, an anticipation of what I could uh, say in a while about TEM and this HADF mode. Uh, to switch on another example of nanocomposite, which are gold nanoparticles on silica spheres. And we see this HADF contrast. I will uh, just explain that a little bit later. And this, uh, the, the white dots are simply gold nanoparticles in the range 2, 5 nanometers uh, on, on top or attached to silica balls. And the question is really, uh, really to know, well, uh, may, may I have a good description of the, the 3D structure? Uh, when I see a projection where I see these white dots on, on a, a silica particle, that is this kind of 2D projection. What is the 3D reality? Are those particles embedded into the silicon uh, uh, ball, or are they just at the surface? Of course, you can, you can go tilting experiments, but it can be very tricky if, say, you, you, you have a lot of superimposition problems, and if you want to have a good statistics, this was what we, we wanted to do here, to have a feedback on the synthesis conditions for those, uh, the, those particles. So the idea is just to do, uh, this is a, 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 a a very short uh, sequence of the tilting experiment. And when you do this tilting experiment, you can, after that, reconstruct uh, this. Uh, for some reason, I could not go into the, the great details of that. We, we have not been able to do a, a very uh, com continuous uh, reconstruction. Um, sorry, uh, I can just run that small movie. 
just to show you that when we have been uh, reconstructing this, uh, uh, this microstructure, we have been able to identify that most particles, uh, gold particles that are uh, uh, displayed in blue are inside the silica particles. Uh, the red one are just unknown in their position. It's just because we have not been able to reconstruct all the silica particles in there because of superimposition problems. And some green particles can be located at the surface. And we can, we can do statistics on that for, on, a, on a very, very large number of particles uh, in, the, in this kind of system. So I switched to another topic in the SEM, which is the, uh, can we do crystallography? And crystallography in the SEM is essentially a BSD. A BSD, electron bath scattering or bath scattered diffraction. It consists in, oops, inclining the, the object and getting some uh, pseudo Kikuchi line due, due to channeling effects in the, in the, at the surface of the macrostructure. And we see grains here, and grains mean crystallography. We are talking about, of course, crystalline, crystalline structure. And the idea is uh, we can identify uh, the different orientation with respect to the feature we see in those, in those patterns. And uh, now the, the, the commercial programs are very efficient. They have a kind of a GCPDS. Uh, that data, database with uh, all the information of the crystallography of the structure you, you may want. And if you couple that with uh, EDX, for example, uh, chemical analysis, you can very, very rapidly identify the structure, not only the structure, but the orientation of your material. And this can be done at, say, uh, a fraction of micrometer resolution. Uh, I found, this, the, I found this example, in the uh, recent example in the literature, which is a wonderful work of what can be done. And this is very, very interesting to, to talk about in terms of uh, a topic which is very important for ceramics, as I said uh, at the beginning, that is grain boundary um, microstructure. These are two, uh, com two materials. One is alumina, the other one is zirconia. And these others have been doing this EBSD work and those colors here just represent the orientation of all, all the particles. And what is interesting is that within the software, you can get out the, 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 the crystallography of the big crystal, that is the, the orientation relationship between uh, uh, two crystals sharing the same grain boundary. And we end up with this description in terms of coincidence site lattice or grain boundaries with a great, uh, great uh, correspond correspondence, crystallographic correspondence. And this, this uh, small line, are just uh, showing where you have this uh, famous uh, relationship. Why is it interesting? Is it, it's it interesting because we heard about, uh, about grain boundary uh, microstructure, and especially a grain boundary interface seen films with Wayne um, Kaplan talk. I, I'm sorry he, he had to leave because that would have been a very nice uh, post-suite of uh, the discussion, what he's shown about. Do we have always uh, glassy phases or non-crystalline phases at grain boundary structure? What is clear is that I, I, I found here a paper, which is not a real recent paper, but very, very nice work in TM. And I just uh, reproduce here the abstract of this work. The, 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 what is highlighted is that the well-ordered twin boundaries, twin means coincidence, of course, in, the, in this context, do not contain segrega segregation nor some grain boundary whose plane is parallel to a dense plane of alumina. That means that segregation in terms of chemistry here and pure segregation is related to the crystallography of the surface of the grain, which, is, which has sense, and also to the orientation between two grains. So if we want to approach that from a statistical point of view, you need to do what was done before, a, a statistical analysis of a large area. And for, for that, ABSD is becoming a very, very interesting tool. And the other point is that in this work, they said that they were not being able to reveal any intergranulability phase at the grain boundaries, although they are, there is a lot of impurities dopant in the material. So I will come back on that later. Uh, just to show you another example, this is a, a high resolution image of a twin boundary in a, a, a zirconia, silica doped zirconia. And you see, of course, the twin, we, we have this symmetry which is uh, shown by this line. Obviously, this is an atomic match because of the coincidence between the two uh, lattices, and there is no way to get any intergranular glassy phase 
in, in there because the energy is already at the minimum it can be because of the crystallography. So I move to the FIB. FIB, what is FIB? FIB is essentially a double col column electron microscope where, or double col column machine, where we have an electron microscope that is a scanning electron microscope coupled with an ion gun. So the sample can be looked with the electron beam or can be machined with the electron, with the ion uh, beam. And we also have gas injector that helps to do some in situ experiment also on the, on the specimen. So this is the, 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 the real view of the, inter, uh, the, the internal part of a commercial FIB. What, 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 what we can use it for? We can use it for, for preparation of thin foils for transmission electron microscopy. Uh, this drawing shows you how we can machine a very thin slice, which is a micrometer uh, size laterally, and of course uh, something like 0.1 micrometer or a bit less in the thickness for transparency for electron microscopy or transmission electron microscopy, we, 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 we come up with a micro manipulator and with the, with the help of the gas injector, we, we decompose, decompose some gas containing platinum in order to do some kind of welding, in order to be able to, 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 to take this very small part, to bring it on a, on a TM uh, supporting grid, and just to re-weld it on the bars of the grid, and finally to cut Again, with the ion beam, uh, the, the micro -manipula manipulator end, in order to look in, a, in the electron microscope. You can imagine the interest of that technique because you are preparing the same foil where you want at the resolution of the SEM. And that's, that's very interesting. For example, if you want to look at an interface, if you want to look, well, this is the region where I, I, I see that there, there is some problems. So I have to look at the atomic resolution with the transmission electron microscope there and not in this place. So we talk about uh, tomography in the SEM. We can do also tomography with the FIB. The idea is just to uh, mash, machine and uh, uh, slices like this and just to restart those uh, electron micrographs in order to have a 3D view of the material. I take this example of, of uh, uh, an experiment we did with the help of uh, uh, a commercial um, uh, system. Um, this is a, a, um, a nitria stabilized tetragonal zirconia. And you see the, the, this white area is really the surface of the material. And when you know about zirconia, you know that the surface means also uh, interaction with the stresses, and stresses with the stabilized zirconia can lead to the monoclinic transformation. And if you see clearly, you see that the, the, the bottom of the image has a very nice contrast oops, with respect to the top of uh, the image. And this is due to the transformation that that occurred, and the fact that there are a lot of twins in those transformed grain. So when we do this uh, uh, FIB slicing experiment, we can reconstruct the volume, which is seen here in the X and Y projection, and we can get this uh, complete view. Um, it's, it's quite interesting to see that we, we, we have lines here, and that th those lines are just continuously on this side. It's because there was some problem in the FIB. We, we expect to have a very, very regular step in this machining, and if for some reason there is some shift, you may have some problems in the 3D reconstruction, and that appears here. Uh, and so we can, of course, now scan the volumes in the three direction, and uh, it's a pity we don't have here a, a real composite to see the difference between the, the grain, but at least we see some internal porosity, which are these black dots, and if you, you can make any statistic you want in 3D and measure the, the 3D dimension of your material. Okay, I switch to TEM. I should be at uh, one third of my time. Probably not. Mm -hmm. Almost half of the time if I use 15 minutes more. Okay, TEM. Uh, there is much more to say about TEM than SEM, but I probably, uh, I think that new recent development in SEM makes it a, a, a much more interesting technique for, for, for different reasons, because uh, first of all, it's much less expensive and uh, of course much easier to use. And you've seen that we can do a lot of uh, very nice characterization of microstructures with this uh, machine. So 
What I, wa I want to go through very, very rapidly is all these imaging uh, techniques, and after that I will say maybe a few words about uh, chemical analysis technique. Uh, we can go from conventional TM to high resolution TM to this uh, STEM HADF uh, technique I was talking about, and I will also uh, do some, uh, um, show some illustration, I hope, about chemical mapping in a TM. So conventional TM, I, I skip that, it's just to have uh, some, uh, some um, a transparency for uh, completude. Uh, I will prefer to uh, uh, spend a bit more time about high resolution TM. High resolution TM is essentially uh, an interference between all the beams that come out from the crystal material. I, I, I just, of course, uh, suppose that the material is crystalline. So we are doing a, a multi-beam interference image, and the information limit is roughly about one angstrom. Uh, so I, I want make, maybe to, to make a short uh, theoretical, very easy description of the principle of the, the, the image and the resolution in the image. Let's, let's uh, take an example of material, which is a ceramic. In this case, this is molite. And this is the diffraction pattern which is calculated. Let's imagine now that your microscope has a resolution which goes in reciprocal space up to the, 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 oops, the aperture that is drawn here. And if we do the interference between those beams, you just produce this pattern, and we just have two sets of lattice planes that correspond to, to, to to these two sets of diffracting beams. Very easy. We can say that this corresponds to the projected atomic potential in reverse contrast. That means uh, electrons are deviated by atoms, so at the position of atoms, you may expect less electrons than between the atoms. And here, I show the atoms in white. So if we increase the resolution or the aperture, you will increase the resolution of your image. And that exactly what we can get in the electron microscope. And at one moment, if the resolution is sufficient, that is, if you go, if you, if you collect information far in the reciprocal lattice, you end up with a projected uh, atomic potential which corresponds exactly to the atomic structure of the material. Uh, I'm sorry, I made a, a small mistake. Uh, um, in this case, obviously, the atoms are, are, are drawn in black. It's a reverse contrast of the, of the atomic potential. So this is the image you may expect from a microscope with a one angstrom resolution. And you see in this case that uh, we have uh, these uh, um, purple atoms which are uh, oxygen and we can, oops, I'm sorry, I play with this game. Uh, we can resolve the position, clearly the position of all atom oxygens in this material. But of course, you may not have the microscope, that microscope. You may have a, a poorer microscope. And then doing this, uh, map of the atomic potential, you have a, a good feeling of what, what would be the image you have get with microscope. And you can say, okay, well, I do not see clearly the oxygen atoms, but I see that this dot is elongated. That is, I, I begin, to, whoops, I begin to, to feel the presence of oxygen columns uh, besides the aluminum uh, column in the center. So the things are a little bit more complicated because the microscope has aberration. And the, the, the most important aberration is the uh, uh, spherical aberration. And that multiply in a reciprocal space your information by a so-called transfer function, especially a contrast transfer function. Uh, the, the, uh, the equation is this one. It's not very complicated. It's multiplied by a partial current damping envelope, which obviously uh, will damp the information at very uh, small distances that high spatial frequency because of the fact that the electron beam is not fully coherent. And you have two terms in this, uh, in this uh, transfer function which has a sine shape, a term depending upon the spherical aberration coefficient, and a term depending upon the defocus, that is the way you're adjusting the, the focus of your image. And we know from a very simple theory that there is an optimum the focus value, which is called the Scherzer defocus, for which this contrast transfer function with respect to the uh, spatial frequency has this shape. And in blue, you have all the position of the Fourier coefficient of the project potential. So I'm, I'm talking uh, very seriously here, but to be very simple, these are the diffraction beams. And you see that these diffraction beams occur at given spatial frequency. And if the contrast transfer function is uh, approaching the maximum either plus one or minus one, you have a good transfer 
of this spatial frequency. And if it cuts, I mean, the uh, uh, origin, the, sorry, the, the y-axis at some uh, spatial frequency, you do not have any more transfer. And you see here that this uh, gray curve is the damping envelope. And in a conventional microscope, this damps the information uh, at uh, a certain uh, spatial frequency, that is, for small distances. So in this case, the resolution of microscope is defined as the first cutoff of this contrast transfer function for this optimum scarce energy focus. And at this point, if you do an experimental image in the, f in the, in the, uh, the field of the ki kinematic approximation, I will, not, of course, not go into the details of the more complex uh, development, theoretical development of that, uh, of that problem, that is the interaction of the electron with the matter, you should be able to get an image with really resounds the, the, the projective potential, as I said before, developed at the resolution defined by the cutoff of the contrast function. And this is what you get here. But of course, the, ex the user can turn the focus. And if you turn the focus, you change the, say, the shape of this contrast transfer function. And when you change the shape, you change the, the way you cut the information. And so the image has a different aspect. And there, there the problem is where are the atoms in this image? Because you're not, for many reasons, not always able to do the best image at the good defocus for a given material. So we can run for that a lot of simulations with dedicated software. Uh, I could give you a details, but I guess it's not very important on that point. Uh, and we can still match any model to the experimental image to get a clear idea of the, the structure, atomic structure of your material. So we want to improve the resolution. Improving the resolution means, OK, we see that the problems come from two, two factors. The first, the damping envelope. And second, the shape of the contrast transfer function, which is essentially due to the aberration, uh, uh, spherical aberration. And what, what is uh, spherical aberration doing? Spherical aberration uh, is, is making the fact that uh, uh, in a perfect lens, you see this uh, optical ray should go uh, as a green line here. But because of the spherical aberration, the lens is actually much more converging than it should be. And this uh, optical uh, ray goes, uh, crosses the optical axis much sooner than it should be. And this makes that any uh, uh, point in the uh, object will be imaged as a disk, the, 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 the diameter or in fact, the, 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 the size is related to the spherical aberration coefficient and to the, the angle under which uh, the object is seen. So what we want to do is to suppress this effect. And actually, people, and I, I put some references here, people are, are doing that with so-called CRS correctors. And they can drop the CS from a, a value of 1.2 millimeter to a value, a value of 50 micrometer, or even zero. And if you do so, the same curve uh, shows that this resolution, which is defined by these cutters, moves to higher spatial frequency, and we can easily get uh, one angstrom resolution. How, how is it, uh, is it been done? Uh, well, basically, it's just to uh, add uh, an additional lens before the objective lens that deviates uh, the, the, the optical rays in the reverse direction so that the final convergence of the aberrated uh, objective lens brings uh, the ray in the correct position. But we, you cannot correct that uh, totally at, the, at all orders, and you end up with some, uh, still some resolution limitation. When you see that, you say, well, OK, now I'm not limited anymore by the CS aberration, but I, I'm limited by the, 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 the coherence envelope. And coherence means chromatic aberration. So now people are working on uh, correcting the chromatic aberration. And we can do that by monochromating the electron beam, or we can do that with hardwares, which are just under development at this time. But say, if you use a, a monochromator in order to reduce some uh, parameter, which is, in fact, this uh, defocus spread here, which is due to the coherence and the technology of the electron uh, gun, you can uh, slightly or sorry, significantly increase the transfer at the resolution of one angstrom. And you see, in that case, we should be able to get a very nice image 
with this resolution. I, I, I do not have any um, illustration of that uh, on ceramic material, but remember Wayne Kaplan show, showed us a elaborated corrected image of grain boundary, and he was talking about delocalization. And what is delocalization? This is a, this is a, a high resolution image in, in a, a usual uh, high resolution microscope that are actually uh, um, platelets precipitates in aluminum alloys. And you see that because of the defocus, you have uh, Fresnel fringes that gives you ghost images around your defect. And it's a bit tricky to, 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 to adjust that perfectly from, I mean, an experimental setting uh, point of view, but it's also very tricky to, to say, okay, well, the, the, the atomic structure is this one or this one because you have this mixing up with these fringes. When you go with the uh, uh, corrector on, you just suppress that because remember, now the good defocus is a very, very small value. So we're very close to the Gaussian focus. And for those who know a bit about optic, Fresnel uh, diffraction is suppressed if you go to Gaussian focus. So you don't care anymore about this effect. And you got a very nice image at one angstrom resolution. So I will probably skip uh, that part, uh, but uh, that will be in my notes. It's just to tell you that, okay, we are now able to do high resolution imaging at our atomic resolution. We are now able to produce very nice images, but we want to do measurements. We want to get numbers to say, okay, my model is correct, but I want to judge that from an objective point of view and not just seeing this image. I will, as a PhD student, believe that this model match well my image and I have to convince my supervisor and I have to convince the referee that I, 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 I'm, I, I'm okay with that. So to convince that, we may use uh, error factors or calculation of image agreement factors uh, based on cross correlation and all these things and I will just want to give you a, an illustration of that in my notes. But I will skip this part. And I will talk about HADF imaging. Because HADF imaging is also a, an old technique which is becoming more and more used these days in a transmission electron microscope. What is HADF imaging? HADF means high angle annular dark field imaging. The idea is that you have you scan the probe in the transmission electron microscope, so we are again back in a stem mode. And we just collect at high angles the scattering. We see essentially an incoherent scattering. And what is interesting by the incoherent uh, nature of the scattering is that if it's incoherent, you know that you add intensity and you don't add amplitude. So this imaging mode is not subjected to multiple diffraction as it is in conventional electron microscopy. And that suppresses a lot, a lot, a lot of problems. So it's very easy to do that. And if you want to go to the physics of that, it's rather simple. A few equations. What is interesting is to see what is highlighted here. The intensity of the HADF mode is essentially proportional almost to the square of the atomic number. So the heavier the atoms, the brighter the intensity. So we can use that very easily as in conventional microscopy. This is the first example on, on uh, alumina uh, zirconia nanopoders. This is a conventional image, is, uh, image in bright field TEM. And you see here that when we switch to HADF, you have some gain in the contrast in this part because we are much more sensitive only to the chemical nature of the atoms that are present and not to uh, diffraction contrast. Of course, we can improve we can improve that image by tilting, by spending some time to find good diffraction contact, but it's time consuming. This is straightforward. And then we can do whatever you want, measurements on the size of particles, depending on the treatments or whatever. Uh, i show another example. I wanted to show that because uh, uh, just the way I could remember that I've been uh, doing some work with uh, Jose Moya and Ramon Torresias is here. He's not here, but. Uh, these are malite zirconia nano composites, and again, this is the uh, conventional bright field image and the uh, stem HADF image where you see these, do these brighter particles which are of obviously zirconia. Another example going to a gas pressure centered silicon nitride with addition of yttrium oxide alumina. Uh, 
This is an HADF image where you have a silicon nitride grain here, another silicon nitride grain, and a very bright contrast in the middle, which is clearly the presence of a nitria, which is much heavier than uh, silicon or nitrogen uh, rich grain boundary layer. You see that this image uh, shows some, say, atomic resolution. And it's very interesting to uh, use this TEM HADF image in the atomic resolution mode, but for that we have to resolve atomic colon. So how can we resolve atomic colon in this mode? It's very simple. This is a drawing of the structure of the beta silicon nitride. Look down to the C-axis. And again, I will describe that in terms of atomic potential. So this is the atomic potential of this material. And obviously, you will resolve this atomic column if the probe size is smaller than the distance between two atomic columns. So if you use a probe of 0.6 nanometer wide, you will, just n we, you will not be able to resolve this, uh, these rings, but you will be able to see the holes between those rings. And this is the image we've got uh, previously. If you increase the resolution by uh, uh, decreasing the probe size, we can begin to fill these, these rings. And if you work with a probe size in the one angstrom range, you will be able to do a wonderful atomic image of that. And this has been done. This is work uh, by an English group. On, uh, remember, this is the uh, expected simple image with the probe size of one, one angstrom. And this is the experimental image they, they've got. Obviously, Again, we are facing the aberration correction, uh, aberration, uh, um, spherical aberration, not of the objective lens, but of the condenser lens which forms the probe. And you have to have a CS corrector in order to achieve this one angstrom probe size. And uh, this is what uh, has been done in that case. And since I'm on that subject, uh, still this is illustration of this uh, very nice work. These people have been working on uh, rare, rare earth dot silicon nitride materials. Why rare earth? Uh, because it's, these are heavy elements, easy to see in the HADF contrast. And they've been doing a, a very nice uh, uh, set of experiments uh, regarding the uh, location of the lanthanum or lutetium atoms at the uh, integral of film uh, of, of the silicon nitride materials, and they, they've been able to locate precisely these atoms, looking at, uh, to grain boundaries in different directions. So it's very nice work, and uh, this shows uh, what we can do with HADF at the atomic resolution. But now HADF is also interesting for doing tomography. Remember, we've been doing tomography in the SEM by tilting experiment. We want to do that in the TM because the resolution is better in the TM than the SEM. But the question is, well, why do we need HADF contrast? We just, which we could just be able to use conventional imaging. Again, I'm sorry not having any uh, illustration on that in ceramic uh, systems, but uh, I use a precipitation uh, situation in aluminum alloy, and we can consider that as a nanocomposite, since you see the, the, the specimen is uh, this kind of fiber, and you see the dark dots are uh, precipitates, magnesium uh, zinc precipitates in aluminum uh, uh, matrix with a very small size of those precipitates. So if we want to do bright field tomography, of course we have to tilt, but when you tilt, you have diffraction contrast. And you see in that case, we've been tilting by three degrees. And you see that the, sh the, 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 the aspect, the contrast within the, the material has changed. We're losing some contrast of some precipitates. And we, we're losing also what is called Bragg, uh, uh, Bragg fringes in, in the matrix. And this prevents uh, any correct reconstruction because the, the algorithm will consider that as a, a, a mass variation. And it, it will be totally flawed uh, if it accounts for, for this contrast variation. Now, if we go to HADF, since HADF is an incoherent scattering, you don't care about diffraction. So when you tilt, you always have a constant relationship between the intensity and the mass thickness. Why mass thickness? Mass uh, regards the Z atomic number, and the thickness is related to the number of atoms that are uh, irradiated in the, in the probe, beam, uh, in the probe uh, of the electron microscope. That is the atomic density. 
So uh, maybe you, you know the special shape of, uh, of, this, of this specimen, which is not a usual thin foil for TM. Uh, the idea is that, again, we, we want to, to use large tilt for an accurate tomographic reconstruction. So if you work with an usual thin foil, you can just make a drawing. When you tilt the specimen at 70 degrees, you have a, 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 an increasing amount of thickness of material to cross for the electron. And then you, you have a very, very bad signal to noise ratio at very high uh, angle. So the idea is to produce ideal objects that uh, do not have any shadowing effect when you tilt them, and who always have the same thickness when you tilt them. That is kind of cylinders. And we've been, with the help of colleagues, I will uh, just mention uh, in the next uh, slide, we've been able to uh, produce this needle shape uh, specimen. And this is an HADF image of the very top, uh, very, very end of the, of the tip of this material. Uh, uh, with, uh, we showed this, those precipitates with nanometric resolution. And so, after that, we just run the sequence. This is the tilting experiment. This is the reconstructed volume. And again, we can do whatever we want. We can measure the shape. We can, re we can relate the shape with the crystallography. We can estimate the volume fraction and whatever. And you see that we have a very nice perception of the 3D uh, organization of the, uh, uh, the particles within the material. So. Uh, what, what is my remaining time? <laughs> Sorry? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. I will, I will just say very few words about uh, analysis techniques. You see I have three items, EDX, yields, and uh, energy filter TM. So, very rapidly, EDX, we heard about this. EDX is just the collection of the X-rays coming out from the sample. I would just skip that because it's not very important. We may be interested in spatial resolution. Obviously, in a burst specimen in the ACM, you have a, a very large interaction volume. So the X-ray photons come from all that volume. So you cannot have a good resolution, spatial resolution, if you work with a massive or bulk sample. But it, in the in the thin foil, in the TEM, uh, since the, the foil is essentially very thin, you have a bin spreading, which is in some cases rather negligible, and you can achieve nanometric resolution with the ADX. What I want to illustrate here are the possibility of chemical mapping. And I want to uh, stress the point that uh, rather recent detectors uh, are available since couple of years, that changed totally the world of people doing EDX experiment, because as you probably know for those who are using this technique, EDX requires uh, liquid nitrogen cooling because it's uh, based on the silica duct material and it should not end up if you raise the temperature. So uh, it's, very, uh, um, it's a great constraint. But now new technology exists without liquid nitrogen and which uh, a great advantage of being much more efficient in counting at very high rates. And this is very interesting because it gives you the, now the uh, ability to produce chemical maps very, very rapidly. And this is an example of a metallurgical sample. Again, I do not have any uh, ceramic system here to illustrate that. And this is a, a chemical map. You see the, 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 the range here is uh, 40 micrometer, uh, sorry, 10, 10 micrometer. And you see, in 30 seconds, the, the map we get with this technique, and it, it may be enough to locate roughly the elements. Of course, if you increase the, the counting rate that is increasing the, the, the beam intensity, within the same time, only three scans, you can get this wonderful result image. And then you have a very nice uh, vision of the microstructure of the material. So this can be known also in the TM, but I skip that, just to talk a bit about EELS. EELS, electron energy loss spectroscopy. The idea is that when you're doing the interaction between the primary electron of the beam with the electron of the atoms within the material uh, which is studied, uh, you have an energy loss. And if you have just a prism 
below with the magnetic field, you can disperse as the light these electrons. And then you end up with uh, Eels spectra, spectrum, where you see the elastic peak, that is the electron that do not experience any, uh, ex any uh, energy loss. And then first peaks at, uh, say, a few tens of EVs, um, plasmons, which are collective electronic excitation of the uh, free electrons within the material. And after that, at higher energy losses, the ionization ages. What is very interesting is that we work at a sub-EV resolution. And sub-EV resolution, I, I have no time to, to detail that, but I will give some uh, 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 information on, on this in my transparencies uh, written version, is that uh, these ionization edges are in fact probing the density of states of the atoms you are looking at. And if you probe the density of states, you are just sensitive to uh, the chemical bond. And the chemical bond varies, for example, for an, a, a given atomic spacey, depending upon its um, environment. This is a, a work by a French group of Christian colleagues here, who showed the difference of the aluminum LH in different structure under the metallic state or when it's linked to oxygen in these uh, alumina materials. And from that, you can just have a fingerprint of the chemical nature of uh, the element in the material. Uh, this is another example, very nice example. I'm sorry, I should have completed this, uh, oops. No more uh, uh, reference here. Uh, this is an example where you see the oxygen K edge in various zirconia material. And you see that this oxygen K edge shows two uh, main peaks. The distance, energy distance uh, between them is clearly related to the amount of stabiliz st stabilizing yttria uh, uh, oxide. So, uh, Again, I said you will have some rapid and brief explanation about the physics of that, but I probably skip that. I will skip that too. It's just a comparison just for uh, uh, information between EELS and EDX, the, 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 drawbacks or, uh, the drawbacks and the advantages of each technique. And I will just move to energy filter TEM. Since we've been able to discriminate the electrons that have experienced different energy losses, we can select them with some uh, slit, real, real actual slit, in order to uh, produce filtered electron images. And the, the idea is just uh, illustrated by this montage. This is the area you, you want to look at. And then you, you move uh, your slit in different energy position, and you acquire different images like this. And from that, with software, we can, after that, reconstruct by just numerical work on the computer uh, the region of the sample where we have this experience, this, uh, 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 this uh, uh, energy loss uh, due to this uh, atomic transition for the A element and this one for the B element. And we can also reconstruct the whole spectra from a given region by probing through this series of images. Uh, this is an example of what can be very easily done on a ceramic co uh, composite material um, with the plasmons. The plasmons are, as I said, excitation, collective excitation of the electrons, and they obviously depend upon the material. And in this material where you have um, different grains, silicon nitride, silicon nit uh, carbide, and uh, boron nitride, uh, you, you may expect that the plasmon energy, uh, the plasmon energy peak, uh, is moving. And if we do this uh, FTEM imaging, we can just, after that, rebuild the map of the plasmons energy that signs uh, the position of the different elements. And we, again, it's a, it could be a way to approach the integral fa integral phase, phases problem in uh, uh, those materials. So I will just finally end up with some illustration of these green boundary problems. And uh, again, as Wayne did that, I will just refer to the previous work, uh, pioneer work by David Clark. We've been showing that, obviously, if you add some chemical elements 
during the sintering of your material, you may expect that grains may be wetting by a liquid phase, and we may expect that this liquid phase is retained uh, when you cool down the material at low temperature. Uh, there is a bunch of techniques that have been used or that are currently used from a very simple technique that you, like diffuse dark field, Fresnel contrast, or even uh, analysis. But obviously, the best technique is high resolution imaging. I would like to refer to the pioneer work of, of a French guy which, with Alain Torel, with whom uh, uh, I, I, I did that paper, when he was certainly one of the first to, to uh, try to uh, get an experimental evidence of the ordering of the non-crystalline phase at the surface of the grain uh, in the grain boundaries. And uh, again, we, we may consider that it's very in, in, important in terms of thermodynamics, in terms of weighting uh, problems at the surface. And you see that in this silicon nitride material, there is a non-crystalline phase here. And you see that there are uh, ending atoms that shows some regular arrangement. And this was the beginning of his work. And uh, I, I believe there, are, there should be much more efforts to continue uh, that work. So there are a lot, a lot of, uh, of uh, works uh, being done, and still recently, uh, on, on the problem of imaging those uh, grain boundary phases. This is a very interesting work uh, done by the German group in situ eating experiment. And when you go from the room temperature microstructure to the high, high temperature in the microscope, you see an increase of the intergranular phase. And we cool down again back to room temperature. You see a kind of tendency to retrieve the original thickness. That should uh, argue, uh, allow to argue about some uh, reversibility. Uh, Wayne said we, he, he was spending uh, years to, to work on that problem and trying to uh, observe integral in our films. Somehow I did the same work, and uh, I've been looking at very different systems. This is a very simple example on uh, uh, alumina silicon carbide composite. Of course, if you want to, to look at the interface, you must have the interface edge on, and you can, you can get very nice uh, lattice images, but the interface is not edge on. When you get the interface edge on here, you, 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 you are not able to see any grain boundary uh, phase, although there is no uh, specific orientation relationship between these two grains. Remember, I told you that uh, crystallographic orientation has to do with the equilibrium, possible equilibrium uh, at the interface, that is in terms of segregation of or establishing of a non-crystalline film. This is another example of a silicon nitride, which is known to produce easily grain boundary phases. And again, no specific orientation relationship and no grain boundary phase. And we've been also doing with uh, my colleagues in Lyon, Gilbert and Jérôme, who just arrived, uh, some experiment in uh, looking, uh, in, in, in uh, um, analyzing the effect of the cooling uh, uh, speed from high temperature after sintering. Uh, if we slow cool the sample, we end up in this zirconia uh, containing quite a lot of silica phase. Uh, we end up with uh, very uh, clean grain boundaries. And if we quench that, we end up with large grain boundary phases, uh, which, which, which can be analyzed, in this case, by Hill's technique, and which are shown to correspond to uh, obviously silica-based uh, phase. And as a conclusion on that point, I'm pretty sure that the question is still open. And I just uh, uh, extract some uh, sentences from uh, this recent work I was already mentioning. The answer to the question, the equilibrium configuration of the integral gray, uh, glassy film is representative of which temperature is still not yet clear. It was written in 2006, and I don't believe the situation has been evolving uh, that much today. And the other remark is the fact that the integral glassy phase thickness is not constant along grand boundaries, as was shown by these authors, strongly question whether the amorphous phase is in any equilibrium state. So that would be my uh, conclusion for uh, this. Oh, sorry, I, I should have gone back to 
this last uh, slice to thank you for your attention. <laughs>